So you probably can't do Agile under all contracts, but you certainly can do Agile under the right kind of contract. Um, I like all of the stuff that JB said, but what if you know you get all of the stuff from the designers all done before you actually get the contract? Well, you have a little problem. Um, but I don't have any trouble with fixed price, so I'm going to start by telling you a story, and this is a true story. It's a story about when I did, well, when I was on the other side of a contract than the one that was developing, because I think in order to do agile under contract. You have to understand what the other party is thinking in their head. So we have to go back to the time before PCs, when, uh, and see, these would be mainframes here, big, big mainframes. I never worked with big mainframes. But before there were PCs, I worked with computers about the size of this table. And those mini computers, one of the Early things that they were used for is to control equipment. Uh, that, that was the first thing that right size to make any sense to put in a factory. So my job was to program these things and make them control great big roll goods processes. I worked for 3M. I worked for a couple other companies too, but the, the one uh, that I'm going to talk about was I worked for 3M and my computers controlled stuff that made adhesive tape, you know, or masking tape or any of those kinds of tape. And um, I love that kind of computing. I think it's the best kind in the world, but that was maybe before the web. Um, and I got pretty good at it. I started out in an engineering department that was called INCS, Instrumentation and Control Systems. And as a group, and not just programming, uh, in fact, programming was really new. I worked in a group of electrical and mechanical engineers who had been putting control systems on big roll of good processes for decades by that time, and they knew how to do it. Um, but they always wanted to use the latest technology, and this was the latest technology, so I was going to be the one to program computers. Now, back in those days, a lot of people were intimidated by computers but not the people in the electrical and mechanical engineering department that have been designing control systems for decades for big roll good processes. Computers was just another way to do what they already did with wires and components and uh, just a new technique and it wasn't anything particularly special. And after a while um, of doing this, putting those computers in place of some of the electronics, I got pretty much experience and I was taught by a group of people who had been doing this kind of electrical and mechanical stuff for a long time. And we did projects. We put projects into manufacturing plants, and uh, that typically took a year. And you know, we didn't have these things called requirements. We had just a, a really simple idea, and that was something in a year from now, and the date was already set, um, you are going to put a control system on a process that those guys upstairs are designing and it will make good product and um, you have a rough budget we added 30% because computers are a new technology simply sometimes we add 20% if it's simple and that's how our budget goes deadline is fixed and you really can't spend any much more money um, but this group knew how to do estimates based on history so they took history, added 30%, and that was the budget. And when the thing went into the plant, it, we might have a month of startup over the year. It had to make very good product. It had to control the process that those guys upstairs were currently designing. So you want to know what it had to do? Go up and talk to them. And um, the plant engineer would then maintain it over the rest of its life. And the had to be something the operators found convenient to use because one thing we were told was in a manufacturing plant operators make product and if your computer gets in their way your computer will not be used but they will make product so if you don't find make something they find convenient they won't use it and it's your fault because you didn't understand what they were thinking 
So that was my job. I did a few of those control systems. I got actually reasonably good at it. One time there was a warehouse um, control system that was being put in by a, a outside contractor and it was a disaster. It was a disaster because when they put it in on time and on budget, it moved so slowly that it took five or ten times longer to fill orders than it had manually. And so I was the one that got to evaluate it because it was a computer problem and there weren't too many computer folks. And I said, well, here's what's wrong and here's how they should have done it. And, you know, I wasn't much friends of the contractor. But um, at least I got a reputation of somebody that could, like, watch how outside contractors were working and perhaps um, criticize them. And then uh, one of the engineering managers got the idea that maybe if he hired some outside contractors, I could keep track of what they were doing and keep them from making mistakes. So one day, after I'd been doing this for, say, five years or three years or four or something like that, um, and I've been programming for a dozen years. There is this guy named Harold Stressman. Now, I didn't know Harold. He was a senior plant, plant product engineer. At least I didn't know him at first. And he was in a manufacturing plant that was making video cassettes. And um, he had a desire to have all of the different points, process control points, brought into a computer database so he could do statistical analysis on the quality results compared to the way the system worked, the, the actual um, control set points of all of the different speeds of the motors and tensions and pressures. He figured if he could do that, he could make better tape, okay? And then there was Dave. He was, now Harold was about eh, 100 kilometers away in a plant. Her Dave was upstairs. He was the head of the of the group that made the process systems that we did the control systems for. And then there was me, and I was the process control engineer. And then Dave came to me one day and said, we have, I've done something, and I didn't know Dave until he came to me. Um, and he said, you know, I have hired an outside vendor to create the system that Harold needs. What does Harold need? He needs process points in a database so he can do statistical analysis. And I've hired XRI, and they're going to do this. It's going to take about a year. It's going to cost so much money. Fixed price contract, by the way. And the um, interesting thing is that the plant cannot afford any more money. If it costs more than this, it will make their product too expensive to sell. It can't go over budget. And basically, budget and time are the same thing. So it really has to be on time because if it isn't on time, it will go over budget. Now, I have decided to do this time and materials, not fixed price. But it is fixed price. It's just that um, Harold doesn't have any much more knowledge of what he wants except data points in a database. And so I can't really write this big, long specification for a fixed price contract. So you will make it fixed price. How about that? In other words, I would like you to make sure that this thing is, in fact, on time and does whatever Harold wants over the next year. Would you do that for me? And uh, of course, I didn't get to say no. So, <laughs> so I, I said, well, how do you think I should go about it, right? <laughs> um, so note in this, in this uh, scenario, which is Absolutely true. Um, Harold really didn't care what he got, as long as the data was in the database. Didn't have much of an idea how to do it. And I had been in a group of uh, a bunch of programmers that could have done this. I could have programmed every line of code in there, but it would have taken a lot longer than a year because it was a big system. So I could read all of the code. I could understand what they were doing. And so Dave wanted me to make sure that the thing was on time and on budget and, you know, theoretically fixed price. And the time and materials problem was this. His boss, Dave's boss, told him he was crazy. How can you possibly make this time and materials when it should be fixed price? And um, the thing about t fixed price contracts is that they tend to create a bad behavior between the two organizations. But I understood, Dave understood, Harold understood better than anybody because he was the one in the plant that couldn't afford any more money. Um, and, and XRI understood, hey, 
this is really fixed price. We have to have this done, and we've got a year. So what did I do? Act one, he signed the time and materials contract against his boss's advice, and my job was to keep him out of trouble and make sure Harold got what he needs. That's it. That was a description of my job, and for about a quarter of my time for the next year and a quarter, that's about what I did. Um, and I didn't actually know how to do this. Now, you might call this project management, but that wasn't anyway the way Dave thought of it. It was keeping him out of trouble. Um, so what happened is he said, I think every month you should go check how they're coming along and make sure that you think w you, d you believe that what they're doing is the right thing. So every five weeks for about a year and a quarter, I flew to Salt Lake City from Minneapolis. And by the way, um, usually Harold came with me. Sometimes the people in, the, in our organization that were designing the control uh, interfaces, because that was not done by XRI, that was done by our group. Sometimes the people from the plant who were going to maintain it. So three, four of us flew there every single month. Um, and what we ha did when we got there is we reviewed their work. So it was a two and a half day visit, first afternoon, hello, how's it going? What do you think's going on so far? And then they gave me a stack of listings. <laughs> now. It was impossible for them to show what they'd done so far because in the end it had to be hooked up to process stuff that wasn't even in existence yet. So they gave me these listings and I went back to my hotel and I spent the next three or four hours going through the listings and saying, do I believe what they told me they did in the last month is actually here in the listings, right? And then we had a meeting the next day and we would, wa we would ask them, uh, they would ask Harold, well, what about this, and how about that, and how do you think we should handle this? And I would say, okay, so here's where I think you are. You can describe it in more detail. Tell me how you're going to be done on time. And it didn't matter what they told me before, the last month or the last two months. It was, tell me, given this, how are you going to be done on time? Give me a plan from now on for the next seven months, six months, five months, whatever it is. And they had to tell me in a great amount of detail also, sometimes what they had told me they had done so far, I didn't believe. I said, you know, you said that, but that's not here. Well, said one guy to me once, that's not your problem. Well, that wasn't the right thing to say, because it was my problem. It was absolutely my problem. So, you know, he wasn't there the next month. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and it was fixed, <laughs> because I, it had to be on time. It had to do what Harold wanted. But I did not, even though I could have, make any attempt to give them any kind of design, any kind of details of how they were supposed to do it, any kind of detail specification, none of that. That wasn't my job. Even though I was perfectly capable of it, their job was to figure out how to solve Harold's problem. My job was just to make sure that on a month-to-month -month basis they were heading in the right direction and they had a plan to land on time every single month. You could have called it an iteration. It sort of had approximately the same effect. And Act 3, it was delivered on time. I think it was about two weeks late. Um, and it saved the plant in the very first month half of his cost. Because Harold found that there was one pressure on what's called a dancer arm. If you have tape that goes like this, you have it on a thing called a dancer arm that moves up and down. And the tension on that was way off. When they fix the tension on that, they cut the waste by 1% in that product. It was worth half of the price of the whole system. And that was month one. Went on from there. Um, Harold was a hero. He got what he wanted. And remember, he didn't want software. Uh, no interest in software. Couldn't have told you from the hole in the wall what was high priority, low priority, medium priority, couldn't care what the system looked like. He wanted data in his database, period, end of discussion. Nothing else was going to have any, you weren't going to get another word out of him about what he wanted. And me, even though I could have s designed the system, wasn't my job. I wasn't going to tell them what was first priority and second priority and third priority. And maybe you should do this. You know why? Because the minute that I told them what they should do, it became my problem. And I didn't want it to be my problem. I wanted it to be their problem. And that's what Dave told me. He said, make sure it's their problem to be done on time. At the end of, by the way, every single meeting, every five weeks, we would meet with the CEO of this company, and he would say, how's it going? <laughs> and um, uh, so they all knew that at the end of the each month review, 
the senior guy in the company will get some assessment of how they were coming along. So that, uh, I believe they're going to make it. I'm not really comfortable with this forecast that they, you know, schedule that they gave me. So they designed it themselves. And Dave looked brilliant um, because by doing time and materials, he did not have to specify the details of exactly how it was going to be done. So it wasn't his problem to solve the design problem. It was XRI's problem to solve the design problem. And we were very careful not to do it for them because we figured that that was not anywhere where we wanted to go. And by the way, Harold said to the plant manager he should hire me into that uh, suddenly empty IT manager position. I moved to the plant, became IT manager, and you know, the rest of the story goes on from there. But that's true. That happened. And I'm telling you this story because you got to get, if you're going to do a contract, inside the heads of the people who are doing the contract. And in Agile, it's a, well, I don't know exactly what you're going to get. You're just going to have to let it evolve. Hey, that's not good enough for a customer that has this amount of money and this kind of deadline. And if the problem isn't going to be solved by that deadline and that amount of money, they don't even want to start. So um, fixed price contracts are an attempt to put on the contracting party the burden for design and for responsibility to make it all happen. Um, the problem with fixed price contracts, however, is when you put the burden on there, how do you know you're going to get what you want? And if you're going to do that all through contracts, you're going to then people start writing all kinds of details. And, and all of a sudden, you have the person who's writing the contract doing the design of the solution. And if there's one thing I learned, that's really a dumb thing for the contracting party to do. It should be the contractor, the vendor, who does the design of the system and is responsible for having an adequate design to make it work. So when Dave let this contract, which was, by the way, before I even got involved, um, he wanted to be sure that he was choosing a company that could do this, that had enough experience in this domain to do it. And this company did have enough experience to do this kind of thing. There was a team of, I can't remember, a dozen or so people, but there were a couple senior people throughout the entire project that had done this kind of thing before and was capable of coming up with the design and the projections when they let the contract. So when they did the contract, he could, con he could be comfortable that the company was capable of doing it. And they were the ones that should be doing the design. So if you want some lessons from my true story, um, Detailed requirements are not requirements. If you got a page upon page upon page of stuff, it might seem like requirements, they might be called requirements, what it is is design. Now, who's doing that design? Usually amateurs. Okay, so what you got is a bunch of amateur design, but the customer really wants something. They want some high-level business problems solved within a budget, over a period of time, and in software, budget and time are effectively the same thing. Um, yeah, you can increase the team size and increase the price, but increasing the team size doesn't get stuff done faster anyway. So uh, budget and time are more or less the same. The thing that changes is the design, is the how am I going to do it in detail? So should you be a vendor that could solve that problem if only you could do the design, that's what you're trying to do. You are trying in a fixed price. Uh, if, a, if a customer wants a fixed price, that's OK. They have a business problem. This is all the money they have. It needs to be done by this deadline, one or the other. Um, and if you've done something like that before, what you need to try to do is to get the right to do the design. And then you can build your you know, Toyotas or Ladas or you know, Lexus or whatever based on how much money you have as you go along and what kinds of problems you solve. So detail requirements are actually solution design. And responsibility for success lies with a solution designer, which is why I didn't tell him what to do, even though I was perfectly capable of giving that company a detailed list of requirements. The day I did that was the day it's my problem that those were the right, that was the right design, and I knew better than that. Oh, well, let's say Dave knew better than that. Um, and 
So the con responsibility for success lies with the organization that specifies the detailed requirements. And if you're not specifying it and you have a fixed price, that's when you run into trouble. So what you're looking for in a contract is five or ten high-level, real, true requirements, business requirements. That's all the person that's paying you really wants anyway. But because um, they're nervous that maybe you won't be able to do the high-level things, they're going to try to lay it out in detail. And that's where contracts go wrong. If you can get a contract that has five bullet points and a reasonable cost deadline, um, and a reasonable cost and schedule deadline that's fixed price, then you're working within a business constraint. And within that constraint, you should be able to design a solution. You should have enough knowledge in the domain, I can design a solution within that window of time. And if you can, then that can be a really good contract, even if it's fixed price. But if you get all those detailed requirements, then you've got somebody else's you know, amateur design. Who knows if you're going to be able to do that within the fixed price? Um, why not fixed price? Well, fixed price isn't exactly the problem. Fixed scope is the problem. Okay, fixed scope in as in you know 50 pages of detailed requirements, not fixed scope as in five bullet points of the high level thing that the customer needs. So what's wrong with fixed scope? First of all, early scope definition theoretically um, protects the vendors, um, but ex excess scope protects the customer. So here's what happens. A uh, customer is trying to do this design, doesn't really know what they want, and so they lay out all this detail so that they can decide to get rid of some of it later. Because if you come up with some stuff you got to do that they didn't think of, well, then it's going to cost more money, and that's a fixed price. So they're going to put in everything they can think of, whether they need it or not, because they don't know if they're going to need it. And so they're going to ask for all these Bentleys, yes, instead of asking for just what they need. And here's what you get. You get way more features and functions in your system than anybody could ever use or will ever use. In fact, this is, a, this is just a small case from, um, from an old study by the Standish Group. But in that study, they found with custom software development, something like two-thirds of the features and functions seldom or never used. And if this were just an old study, from way back when, I wouldn't put it up here, but I ask people all the time that have software, does this feel familiar to you? And they say, yeah. Does it feel familiar to you guys? Do you work on systems that have way more features than they're ever going to be used? Anybody? Yes? <laughs> so not necessarily, but very often, certainly not your company, right? But lots and lots of places, this is what happens. And only like 20% or so are always or often used. And what Agile is, is it's a process to do that 20% first. Get it done. Get some feedback. Figure out what the next, you know, five or so percent is and get it done and get a feedback. And when you run out of money or schedule or budget or justification or whatever, that's when you stop. But at least you've got the important stuff done first instead of thinking of it all. And even on fixed price contract, you can do this if you have control of the design. So <laughs> development is a learning process. It's a design process. And an experienced vendor, so that's you, say, with some senior people, not everybody, but your, your organization has done this, should be able to guarantee a solution to the high-level problem within a budget and within a, a fixed time, but not the details of what the solution means. If you have to go down to the details, that's when you run into trouble. So solution design should merge during the course of a contract. It shouldn't be written into the contract. If you can get that kind of a contract, you can probably get a fixed price contract and be comfortable with it. So um, uh, I was going to say one more thing here. Let's see if I can remember what I was going to say. What? Right. 
I was in Cornwall, Western UK, two weeks ago. And I was talking with a guy who does contracts, does medical device software, you know, some of the most highly regulated software there is. And he does sometimes government projects. So I said, so when you get a government project, you know, like uh, how many requirements do you get? And he said, well, really, really complex medical device software, government project, maybe 150. I said, 150 pages? And he said, oh, no, 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 no. No, no, 150 requirements, maybe two or three pages. Yeah, two or three pages, that's good. From there, he can design the solution. And he told me that they are in a position where they can actually do continuous rapid deployment of all of the software that they develop. And with that, plus high level requirements, they can, in fact, meet the contract. Let's try another one. Um, this, is, this is about contracts for something other than software. It's for stamping dies. So if you take a look at the top, there's a piece of metal stretched out between two holders, and there's a punch and a die. And if you punch down and up, okay, I've been in a plant, so I love this, like that. So that's what my control system might do. Um, then you get a door, you know, or a boot, or some part of a car. And in, in designing cars, this is the most expensive part of the whole development process. It's not the, the manufacturing of that, it's the dies th and punches themselves. They cost a huge amount of money to cut and to put in place. They're like half of the capital cost of a car design. So in Japan and in the US, okay, so this was a comparison study between Detroit car companies and Japanese car countries, and it was done in the early 1990s. And guess what? In both, mistakes are very expensive. You make a mistake on a die or a punch, and you have made a big amount of money is lost. Now, in both countries, interestingly enough, there are never-ending changes in the design of the car. It keeps getting changed, just like in software. Be, you'd be surprised. And, you know, it's true even in Japan that the design of the car changes over the time that the car is being designed. So um, uh, the focus in Japan is to reduce time, to get to market fast. The focus in the U.S. is to reduce waste. We do not want to spend any money that we don't need to spend. Um, so when you're going for design, then you want to, when you're going for time reduction, you want early design, early cut. Hurry up and design and start cutting. You don't have to finish it, but get started cutting, the des cutting with a big tool. You cut that punch and, and die so that they match. You start cut shaving the metal off like a sculpture. Wait to design, wait to cut. That's what you want to do in the U.S. You want to get the design perfect first, and that's the only time you can start working on it. Now then, let's say there's a change, because there will be a change, right? We all know about that. So in Japan, the designer would have a change, and what they would do is they would walk over to the vendor. This is going to be a target cost contract with a vendor over there, next door, down the street, something like that. And the design engineer and the engineer of the tool and of the die cutter would have a discussion. And they would agree, oh, yeah, we can make that change. And then the, the, tool, the tool engineer would walk out to the plant and make a few changes on the NC machine. And then after that, they would send the changes through for, you know, paperwork later. Yes? If you are the car design engineer, you go and talk to the engineer at the tool and die place. Yes. And the approvals go later. Not in the US. In the US, there has to be an approval process. And everything stops, oftentimes for weeks or months, while the approval goes through. So we're not talking about a major change here. Even the smallest change will cause this long process in the US. It doesn't happen in Japan because the two engineers are expected to work with each other to come up with a agreement. They might call the manufacturing engineer 
who's going to be in the plant responsible for that machine when it gets there to get some approval that way over the phone. That's it. And I'll tell you how the contract works in order to allow that in a minute. So what goes on here is the total cost including changes. So both of these are contracts. This one here is what's called a target cost contract. And this one here is fixed price contract. Now, interestingly enough, then the, the vendors have to make up their money on um, changes and change orders going through. So you've got to go through purchasing if there's going to be a change because that gets your company more money, yeah? But under a target cost contract, the contract covers the overall cost including these changes. So because the contract doesn't have to be changed, the contract says, yeah, there is going to be changes. Therefore, the two engineers that are senior engineers can have a discussion and make the change. Actually finish the cutting of the tool and die until they've stamped out some parts, put them together, found out where those last little adjustments have to be made, and then they finish shaving off that last little piece. Okay, yes. Yes. If it goes over that, well, first of all, you have to understand that it doesn't usually. And the reason why it doesn't usually is because both of those engineers know very well what their bosses expect. They expect the whole thing to be within the target cost. And because that's what they're, how they're expected to behave, generally speaking, they are careful to, the, the, the tool and die engineer is careful to anticipate changes and work in such a way that it's easy to do the kinds of changes he knows are coming. And the engineer that's looking for changes is careful not to ask for expensive changes. If, however, it goes over, then they go back into negotiations at the management level and figure out how to deal with the fact that something bad happened. Okay, so that's what you do with the target cost. If, if it goes over, okay, well, then um, everybody knew you were trying to do it within this cost. Everybody thought that was possible. Generally, it is. In this case, we can't make it. Neither party wins. They renegotiate how they're going to deal with the problem. And since it's rare, that's okay. And also, since the engineers have no interest in getting their managers involved, they try very hard to stay within the contract price, right? And, and that's really the way it works. But over here, every single change has to go through this massive approval process. So what do we get? We get something that takes twice the time, costs twice as much, and actually is a less good product because the stamping dies in um, Japan, and especially in Toyota, tend to take uh, fewer cycles to actually stamp than the ones made in Detroit under this process. Um, so you get better results too. So this is, I mean, what do you mean they're trying to reduce waste? And the reduced waste comes over here, where the high level idea and the high level cost is there, and the engineers work out as time goes on in the details of the design, the details of the dimensions, the details of the specifications. Instead of, let's give a complete done drawing Wait five months. I mean, I used to be a product manager. We did some of this hardware stuff. It was five or six months to get any die cut. And if it wasn't right, it was another five or six months to get the next one, and very expensive. So this concept of being able to zero in on the solution rather than having it all figured out in front can be a much less expensive thing if the contract is such that the engineers making the decisions can have intelligent discussions about trade-offs within a framework of this house, how much time and money we have. So what you're trying to do is get the details negotiated within a framework of a high-level target cost that includes the changes, not that come in later. So you want to start with a clear understanding of the critical business results that have to be delivered not a list of detail requirements that just, just sort of churn out and, hey, it's not my fault if it doesn't meet the business need. It's what they put me in the contract. Well, that's interesting, but that doesn't help the customer get what they need. <laughs> it's the job of the development team to determine how to deliver the high-level results. If you don't want people to hand you amateur requirements for the design of the solution, then, the, the, then you have to take on that responsibility. Now, you're going to take it on if that's something you're good at, not if they're better at it than you. 
Both parties have to be committed to work together to achieve those high-level goals within whatever business constraints are valid. And business constraints of cost and schedule are typically valid. Business constraints of detailed scope are typically never valid. Yeah, maybe 5% of the time. Um, because as uh, you know, you can build various levels of, of, you know, you can build Bentleys or you can build Lattas or whatever. So um, within the valid business constraints, both teams have to be committed to achieve the goals. So if you think about contracts, <laughs> purpose of contracts, usually companies inevitably are going to look out for their own interests. This is common wisdom, right? Any company out there, they have to look after their own interests. Let me, uh, and so contracts have to be there to limit opportunistic behavior. You know what opportunistic means? Okay, bad behavior. I'm going to take advantage of the other party. Now, I'm going to ask you, anybody who's worked on your contract, have you ever been in a situation where um, if you did this, then that would be good for your customer that you're contracting to. But if you did exactly the opposite thing, it would be better for your own company. Anybody ever been there? Yes, that's not uncommon. And I think the most important thing that contracts need to do is not put the workers in that conflict of interest situation. So the contract needs to be there to align the interest of both parties. That's the most important thing. Now, it doesn't mean there are not some companies out there that will engage in opportunistic behavior. But contracts are probably not the way to solve that problem. Contracts have better purposes. So what you start with is an assumption that the other party is going to act in good faith. Okay? Assume that the vendor is going to act towards you in good faith. Or assume that the contractor is going to act in good faith. And you want to test that assumption, but that would be your first assumption. And then you want to let the relationship limit opportunism. So think about it this way. Um, if I'm the contractor, you know, and I ask for you as a vendor to do something for me, and you start down that path, that means I don't have anybody else doing the same thing. Suddenly, I become dependent upon you. So, you know, I'm in a, I'm in a difficult situation. When we started working with XRI, if they hadn't come through, that would have been a lot of money spent without any, you know, without the value for the money and couldn't afford that. And similarly, once a, a, a uh, contractor starts working with a vendor, then they really start becoming dependent. It's two-directional dependency. The vendor depends on the money from the contractor and the uh, contracting party, and the contracting party depends on the vendor. So you need to build up experience with each other to prove to each other that you're not going to engage in opportunistic behavior. And as you get along the line, if you can develop proof confidence in the other party, then that will limit the opportunistic behavior because the dependency is there. And once the contractor starts to trust you, then things work better. So you need instead to use the contract to set up the correct incentives for good behavior. So nobody ever gets put in that co uh, conflict of interest position. The contract needs to be such that it aligns the best interest of each party with the best interest of the joint venture. Does that make sense? So if I do something that's good for my company, it's also good for what we're working together with that company. Um, and the contract has to be set up with incentives. Now, neither fixed price nor time and material contracts do that. Fixed price is not really very good for the vendor because uh, you get this long list of stuff and they check it off and they don't actually have to pay you because who's going to decide if you've done what's in all those requirements, right? So I've been there. I've been in a fixed price contract where there was no way I could get the customer to sign off that it was done. They just wanted me to do more and more and more. Um, so that was a uh, fixed price was uh, definitely in the uh, favor of the customer not me as vendor. Um, on the other hand, time and materials is exactly the opposite. 
the, in time and materials, the vendor has no real incentive to ever be done. Why would I finish? Then I'm not going to get paid anymore, right? So that's also not such a good contract because if you're a customer, you look at a time and materials contract and you do like Dave's boss does and said, you're crazy. Where's the protection for our company in a time and materials contract? That's just not going to work. So um, what you want to do here is mitigate risk. What we did in that way back time was to mitigate the risk with frequent assessment. Today, you can mitigate risk with frequent delivery. Makes much more sense. But it wasn't possible then. But when they showed me their code, it was effectively, you know, it was as close to frequent delivery as we could come. It's technically possible, it's less expensive, and it's very desirable to deliver software in small increments. Both parties see this, can see this as an advantage really fast. So you want to get that into the contract. And regular delivery, deployment, and evaluation um, of useful functionality, I think it's the best way to mitigate risk. If you want to be safe on both sides, put into the contract frequent points where you deliver and reevaluate. I'll show you another one of those. This is the T5 agreement in, um, for building. This is a construction contract. So you think we've got trouble in software? You should try construction. <laughs> Construction's all contracts. And it's all kinds of little competing companies on site, you know, that want their company to have the best result. And forget the electricians, I've got pipes to put in or whatever. And um, when you have a big thing like a big terminal, um, as they did at Heathrow from 2002-2008. It was a 4.2 billion pound project. Um, how they kept them out of court. The guys that were doing this, BA, BAA, British Airport Authority, had studied all large UK construction contracts and other large airport contracts. And in the UK, every contract of this size was late and was in litigation, was in court. Everyone. So how were they? They didn't have money to go to court. They didn't have money to be late. They just were really kind of, if this was all they had as far as they didn't have cushion. They didn't have a way to go to court. So they said, you know what? We can't sell the risk. We have to manage the risk ourselves. So they did something with the Lean Construction Institute. Um, uh, and they said, we have to do something different. And they created an agreement, which was, they didn't even call it it, they called it an agreement. It was called the T5 agreement. It was a legally binding document that all the vendors signed. And the contractors or vendors agreed to work in teams to mitigate risk, okay, make sure risk was low, and to work together to achieve the best results. Okay, we have a saying in English called motherhood and apple pie. So mother, you know, it's way too simple and way too simple. <laughs> if you, that, of course, this is good, but how does it work? How can you possibly have, oh, we're going to work together to achieve the best results? Yeah, sure. So, <laughs> so how does it work? Because it did work, actually. Well, what they did in practice was they divided it into small pieces, 150 approximately. And each piece had a subgroup of contractors. Not all of them, but this say, say, for example, I got to build an underground railway tunnel. That was part of it because they had to extend the Heathrow Express. So the group of people doing that would have a project, and that project would have a set price that it was supposed to cost and a de date, a deadline. And what they did then was they paid everybody at their cost back. However much money you spent, you got only cost back, no profit. And if you had to tear it out and do it again, well, they'd pay you the second time. Third time, maybe they would wonder if you should be a contractor, right? So you might lose your, your contract. But um, so they didn't worry about, you know, should you have done that wrong and that sort of thing. But at the end of that small project, all of the contractors that were involved in it, they had this pool of money. And they got to split that pool of money in an equitable way, and that was their profit. Now, think of the incentive there. I 
the more the better I do and the better this whole group of people do, the more money that comes to my company. So the contract align the interests of every single person working there. If, if he did well for the whole subproject he was working with or she was working with, then his or her company did well too. So that's what I mean by aligning the interest through the contract of each individual party with the interest of the whole. If the contract does that, then people have much better incentive to behave. Um, so um, uh, a contracting approach, how you think about this. <laughs> First of all, treat software development as a professional service. So I was talking with somebody in the UK who's writing a book about software contracts, and she happens to be a lawyer. And she's talking about software contracts with the government of the United Kingdom. And I'm thinking, wow, that's, a, that's an interesting challenge. How do you do a government contract in the UK and make it something Agile can work with? I said, how do you keep the government from giving me pages and pages of requirements? And she said, well, uh, I mean, how can a government under law actually do that? And she said, well, they do it all the time. They contract with legal firms to do legal services. They contract with uh, marketing firms to do marketing services. They contract actually for software maintenance contracts. And they don't have requirements. They're contracting for professional services. All governments, anybody knows how to contract for professional services. But guess what? Software is not considered a professional service. If you contract for an architecture firm to design a building, you don't put all those details of what the building's going to look like in the architecture contract, do you? Nope, you're contracting for professional services because it's an architect. So why do we let ourselves not be considered professionals? because that's what's going on here. Us, they have to tell every bit what to do, whereas the professionals get a high-level contract that says, you're going to design a nice building. It's going to be done here. And here's approximately how much the design needs to cost when it's built. And here's you know, your land and, and uh, do a good job, because we've already validated that you are a good professional architectural firm. And they don't expect all the details to be there. It couldn't do it because nobody can do architecture in the, in the government. So why do we have all these details in there? Because we're not contracting like it's a professional service. Even software maintenance contracts do not have detailed requirements. So start about asking the people that you are contracting with, how do you contract with professionals? And maybe you could consider us professionals and contract that way. Think about it. Um, Software development sh contracts should figure out, if you're looking for a pattern in the contractor, look for the pattern they use for professional services. The other thing that you really want to do is contract for preferably measurable business results, not technical results. You be a little careful with measurable because it's both the business and you together that are going to make the measurable results true. But having results that can be measured and working with the business to get those measurements in place is not such a bad idea because those measurable business results that you can deliver incrementally are something that tells you how far on track. But don't contract for technical results, contract for business results. High level, five or ten things, one page, maybe two if it's complex. You want to specify then desires of acceptable performance against the measures. You want maybe a couple of things. What's acceptable? What's the aspiration? What would be beautiful, wonderful? What is the um, uh, acceptable level? And what's unacceptable? What's failure to deliver? You want to plan for incremental delivery and deployment, or at least incremental assessment. Um, maybe a month per increment, or 10% of the contract. And a way to get paid, then, because it's truly accepted. Um, you want to assess and adjust the overall approach at each increment. Not the high-level goals. Those are probably fixed. But there are just five or ten of them, and they're just at the high level. The details get rethought of each increment. So it's not, hey, last month your plan said this. You've changed it. 
Um, I can tell you, when I was mon uh, monitoring this vendor, I never said, hey, last month you said you were going to do this, and now you change it. Yeah, it was changed every month. And that didn't surprise me, because that's the way I developed process control systems myself. I never knew 10 months in advance everything that was going to happen for 10 months. So every month, I took a look at the end, and I said, hmm, let's see, what do I have to do to get to the end? And then I took the most important steps, and nine months later, I looked at the end and said, hmm, what do I got to do to get to the end? So that's what you want to do here. Every month or so, you want to assess what is going to happen over the next several months to meet the high-level goals. Um, Make sure that both parties are jointly responsible for the results, not just one party. Um, and especially, don't have them do the design and then you be responsible for that design. Risk should be borne by the party most capable in that area. And um, you use the contract to align the incentives of both parties. Consider the overall target cost with fall short fixed press price subcontract. So the last slide I'm going to do, I think it's the last slide, is going to be against this. Consider overall target cost with short fixed price subcontracts. So target cost. Target cost says you base this on high level goals. What should the system cost? You know, it's going to be a year. It's going to cost this much. That's all we really had in that contract with, with the XRI. The target cost should include changes. Not changes to the high-level goals, but you've only got three or four of them. They're high-level business deliverables. Target cost becomes the joint responsibility of both parties. Harold was never asking for extra stuff. Nobody knew better than Harold that the cost and deadline had to be met. And he was not going to, as the customer, ask for more and more and more. Wasn't in his, his thought process. Goals of the t and target should be clearly communicated to the workers who are expected to meet them. So as a worker, you want to know, you know, how much time, how much window do I have for this section? Uh, negotiations occur if the target might be exceeded. But in any case, neither party should benefit. <laughs> workers at all levels should have clear incentives to work together, to collaborate, and to compromise to meet the target. So the structure of the contract is to create those incentives so that they incentivize people to work together. Um, with a partnership contract, you have an umbrella or a framework contract. You want to establish critical business expectations. That's the main point here. And target cost or target schedule or both. If they're the same, fine. If schedule is an absolute and meeting, you know, if you're contracting for an event like this, it's going to happen today, no matter what, then the schedule really is the driver, right? Um, release work in stages. Keep the stages small. Each stage could be, for example, an iteration. But I mean really as delivered as possible in that iteration. And the iteration scope should depend on the most pressing business needs and the professional judgment of the development team. So your contract form should describe the services, the professional services, not the deliverables. It has to describe the high-level expectation. It has to uh, worry about intellectual property. And it has to provide a framework for how we're going to decide in detail what we're going to do. Who's going to decide? We've got a project manager here and a project manager here. They will every month come up with an idea of what's going to happen the next month. If they can't agree, it will escalate in this manner to this group and that group. So you need to describe the mechanism to come up with the details rather than what the details are. And when there are disagreements, you have to provide for escalation. You also have to protect yourself with some sort of licensing clause so that the, the contracting party can't engage in such bad behavior as grabbing all your software without paying you and still using it. So that kind of protection against bad behavior and for escalation and mediation and termination needs to be in the contract. And that kind of a contract can work if both you and the contractor, and I'm assuming you're the vendor, and I could be wrong, you can be on either side, if both parties 
understand how much better this is be it would be for everybody. Just like my boss, not my boss, my the engineering manager I was working for, Dave, knew for sure that creating a contract which allowed this kind of negotiation would be better for both companies. So you got to get into people's heads. This is really a better way for both companies because you get a win-win contract based on mutual commitment to ki critical goals. It provides for risk sharing. It establishes the correct incentives for the joint venture. It assumes that learning will occur. It expects a res professional response to change and uncertainty and almost always yields faster, better, cheaper results. So why not if you can convince both parties to work this way. So thank you, everybody.